take your seats, if you'd take out your Bibles and turn, if you would, with me to the final chapter, the 21st chapter of John's Gospel. Uh, we have just two more studies uh, this week and next, and we'll be picking up in verse 11 with a little bit of a reread to set the stage for what's going to, to be the focus of this week. But as we think back on Peter's life, as we think back on our lives, I, I don't know how many of you have ever stopped and just praised God for Peter, but I praise God for Peter's life. And let me help you understand why. How many of you have ever known exactly what the Lord wants and then failed to do it? Uh, how many of you have ever stuck your foot in your mouth spiritually? How many of you have said you would do something for the Lord and then failed to do that? Yeah, we, we kind of have all been in Peter's position, haven't we? Most of us at times have been exactly where Peter is. The only difference is Peter was with the Lord himself and he still managed to mess up. And so this passage is tremendously hopeful for us in that regard. Because if really there was one of the disciples that you would say Jesus might have had a real case to just simply say, well, you know, could we kind of replace somebody? You know, we, we, we got rid of Judas. Judas, we know what his problem was. He was never a disciple, but Peter's just not a very good one. You see, if I were Peter, I would be severely condemned right now. I'd be sitting there on that beach just going, man, what kind of follower of Christ am I? And yet we find out what Jesus does with Peter. Even though the truth of this is, Peter denied the Lord three times. Peter's not trusting the Lord. He's gone back to fishing. Peter's not exactly an example of someone who lives his life with, you know, just stellar faith. Peter is kind of an example of a mess up. And yet the Lord Jesus personally ministers to Peter and passes along this incredible commission to Peter, who is, from all intents that we can see, somewhat of a failure. I thank God for that because I haven't always done what the Lord's asked me to do. I haven't always said what the Lord's asked me to say. I, I haven't gone the places that the Lord's asked me to go at times. And I still, to this day, occasionally hear the voice of the Lord and just go, yeah, can I do that next week, God? Especially when it comes to not eating so many cheeseburgers. <laughs> Amen? Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Father, we thank you. Lord, I thank you that you take those of us who have a reason, the enemy would have the ability to condemn us and you commend us unto good works, fruitfulness for your kingdom. And we pray, God, as we read and study that you'd encourage us and strengthen us, build up your church. And Lord, cause us to do great things for your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you would use us, Lord, for your plans and purposes. We ask all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pick up a little bit backwards in verse 11 and reread uh, a handful of verses for context. And then Simon Peter went up and uh, dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. The reason I think that's important is this. One of the reasons that we go into the mission field even today, and the first thing we attempt to do is to meet some need, is because when you can sit down and show someone that they have value as a human being, it's a way to get to their heart. And Peter here is hungry. He's been out all night. He's cold. He's been out on the water. He's wet. He, he, he has not just the enemy beaten down on him, but even his own human senses are telling him, man, my life is not accounting for much. And so Jesus says first to Peter, Peter, look, I love you in a very practical way why don't you come eat with me? And yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Knowing it was the Lord, they were embarrassed. It's like they should have known. They saw him on the beach, but they couldn't quite get it. And so they're staring to be, oh man, it's Jesus. You can almost see him just sitting there going, I, I can't believe we didn't know it was him. And Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And now this was the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
And so Jesus is now on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, a little place called Tabtha. And he's meeting there with them at this little point of rocks that juts out into the north shore of the sea. Common place for fishermen to mend their nets and throw them up in the rocks to dry. And here's Jesus serving breakfast to the disciples, which is the story from last week. In verse 15, he goes on now, and so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And I want you to set your mind right now, kind of figuring out what did Jesus mean by these? There are a lot of things that you could throw into that sentence. It's possible he meant the disciples, maybe he meant fishing. Perhaps he was talking about, do you love me more than the rest of the disciples love me? There's all kinds of ways that you could actually interpret this, and the language gives us no help in understanding what Jesus actually meant by these, if he was being specific. But I think there's a bigger message, and I think that message applies to every last person in this room. Do you love Jesus more than everything? Is there something on this earth? Is there some part of life? Is there some person that you love more than Jesus? Do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to them, then feed my lambs. And while it's true, the Lord Jesus is using the word agapeo. Do you love me with God's love? And Peter's responding back. Yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. And I want to encourage you, if you weren't here on Thursday nights, pick up our three-part series on 1 Corinthians 13. I'll answer all these questions for you. But Jesus is saying, do you love me with God's love? And Peter's answering back, you know that I love you with the very deepest type of relational love I can have as a friend, a battle buddy. Maybe even within the context of marriage. You know I love you a lot, Lord. As much as I'm really capable, I love you that much. But I don't really think that's the focus of this passage. And he said to him again a second time, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And you can almost hear in, in the responses as we get to the third time that Peter is actually getting a little bit miffed with Jesus. It's like, man, why are you asking me a third time, a second time? What's the deal here? Of course I love you. He said to him a second time, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, do you love me? I said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then tend my sheep. And you'll notice there's a slight alteration each time Jesus answers back to Peter. He shifts perspective just slightly, but the focus is always one particular breed of animal, and that is sheep. For all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned unto our own way. Amen? So it's very clear that Jesus is saying to Peter, look, if you really love me, then I need you to love people. I need you to tend to the needs of people. I need you to love people the way I love people. I need you to tend to them the way I tend to them. I need your focus, Peter, to be right going forward from this place. If you really love me, if you love me, then I want you to love who I love and I want you to love the way I love. Tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, bar, or son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. 
And the language here is a little bit ambiguous, but it seems to indicate that Peter's a little bit tweaked. He's not happy about the third time. Grieved as in he's upset a little bit. It's like Jesus is questioning his devotion. And in fact, Jesus is asking Peter, not because Jesus doesn't know who Peter is, but Peter doesn't know what it takes to be a follower of Jesus. A third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Not become a theologian. Not run off the seminary. Not kill yourself. Not show me acts of devotion that are without any kind of parallel. But Peter, I want you to do something really simple. If you really love me, then I want you to love the sheep that I love. Feed them. Make sure they're well fed. For most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. And when you were old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Peter, you're not actually in control but I want to use you. You see, Peter had actually been around another set of coals of fire and those coals of fire were the very place where Peter denied the Lord. And if you remember the scenes that we've already covered in John's gospel, if you were with us, when Jesus was at that final fire with this little tiny servant girl, Peter goes so far as to actually swear It's like, not only do I not love Jesus, I don't even know who he is. So Jesus has every reason to make sure Peter is now convinced that he really loves him. Peter had seen this incredible three-part invitation to a relationship with with Jesus. It's actually the story of the deity of Christ throughout here throughout John's gospel and it began back in chapter 1 where the Lord was continuing to put forth the message that he was in fact the light of the world come into the world. He was in fact Emmanuel, God with us. And so as John the Baptist is sitting at the crossroads in the lower region of the Jordan River Valley, a place where everyone would come and go. And imagine, if you will, I'll take you back for a moment to that day and time. The Jordan River Valley was the place where all of the great cultures of the world essentially met to do some trading and business. From the south, the Egyptians would come towards the north and they would come up the Jordan River Valley. So this incredible 1,500-year-old civilization trading, they're coming from the south. Directly to the east, in modern-day Jordan, you would have this incredible culture of the Nabataeans, the builders, the founders of the rock city of Petra, This incredible city carved out of rocks that was built for the camel caravans as they would come from the east. They would go down to the Jordan River Valley and they would meet at the very place that John the Baptist is now baptizing. From the north, the Phoenicians would come from modern day Lebanon and also the Syrians. And they would come south. And they would trade with the Nabataeans and the Egyptians. And then from the west would come the Romans 
and the Greeks. And they would meet there. So here in this place, with camel caravans everywhere, is John the Baptist in the river saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Come and see. Peter, I, I want you to bring lambs to come and see. I, I want you to bring people to come and see me. I want people to meet me, Peter. But they won't meet me if your focus isn't on sheep. If you're not concerned about what I'm concerned about. Peter knew that part of the message because it was his brother Andrew that got saved and baptized in the River Jordan and Andrew went back and talked to Peter about it and guess what Andrew did? Come and see Jesus. So Peter knew what Jesus was really getting at. A second invitation, which Peter understood very well, happened when Jesus was in Jerusalem in chapter 7 of John's Gospel. And there Jesus has come on the great day of the feast, and they're about to take the water pitchers from the temple and pour them out on the steps of the temple, likely the southern steps, which we go to when we travel to Israel. And there on those steps, that water is poured out. It was not a place where you could normally find a lot of water. When you travel to Jerusalem, there's no rivers in Jerusalem. It's a mountaintop. There are a couple of little tiny valleys with little baby creeks in them. The city of Jerusalem was fed by a couple of springs, the, the springs of Gihon and Siloam. So when anyone needed water, they had to go to exactly the right place in order to find water in the middle of a dry and desert place. It was in that environment that Jesus in John 7, 37 says, he who thirsts, come and drink of me. And if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. It was an invitation to come and be filled with the Lord Jesus, to bring sheep who are thirsty to the one who can supply the drink they need to quench their thirst. Peter was there. He knew who Jesus was talking about. But Jesus hadn't done a good job of that. Because when sheep came in Peter's final time with Jesus in the garden, he tried to kill a couple of the sheep, didn't he? It's not a good way to get them to come and see Jesus. Not a good way to get them to come. Well, I want to give you a drink. Come on over here. It's going to be your own blood. I'm going to take your head off. No. Come and drink. The Lord is still calling sheep to come and drink today. And he wants to use his disciples to preach that message. He wants to use you. You are calling lost sheep to come to the fountain of life to drink of the living water. And in that third invitation that Jesus gives, he gives in this final chapter... And to me, it's actually the most sweet of the three. Because you have to come and see who Jesus is. If you don't see him, you, you won't know him. And you need to come and drink by the Spirit or you can't be one of his kids. But once you have seen him and once you've drunk of that living water and you are one of his kids, here's what happens to us. Jesus invites us to come and be intimate with him and dine with him. Now, for us in our modern world, this is a little hard to understand because our idea of dining is about 45 seconds in the drive through lane at in and out right? We, we drive in, we're like, oh man, I gotta get out of here, and you eat the burger, you throw the wrapper out the window, and you're gone. It was not so then. Outside of marrying someone, the most intimate thing that people did was share a meal with each other. Because it was there that they sat down and found out everything about that other person. 
Jesus is saying, I want to be communing with you. I want to be joined with you. We use the same word in marriage. And the two shall become one flesh. The very thing that Jesus said in John chapter 17, did he not? He said, what I wish for you is the church. What I want for you as my kids is that you would be one as I and my father are one. He's saying, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. He said, I want to put you together as one. I want to commune with you. So he says to them here, hey, let's sit down and get to know each other at the deepest way. And the Lord is still preaching this very message to the entire world today through those who, like Peter, are sharing our relationship that we have with Christ with other people. We are saying to other sheep, come and see the great shepherd. Come and drink of the water that the great shepherd offers. Come and dine with the shepherd of the sheep. He will not give you bad food. He'll give you bread of life. You see, Peter knows these things. And as he sits there with them on the beach, he's healing their hearts. He's saying to them, look, let's get this right because I have a plan to use you going forward. And so he sits down and he begins to commune with them. Get close. As we enter this new year, Jesus wants to be close to you. Jesus does not want to be one of the things on your to-do list. He wants to be your life. It's you and Jesus. And so Peter needed that in his life. And right now he's suffering through all the thoughts. He's sitting by a fire. He's remembering the last fire he was at. It wasn't good. The enemy's beating on him. And so Jesus is basically saying, look, I know how to catch fish that you don't even know where they are. There's little lambs out there and I can show you where they're at so that you can make sure that they know me. But you need my power to do that. They need to come and see and know my power. They need to come and drink and know the purposes that I have for their life because I have a plan and a purpose for them but they need to know what my purpose is because the world's going to give them a whole different purpose. I want them to meet me, Peter. I want them to know me. So I want you to look so much like me that when they meet you and talk to you and walk with you, that it's as if they are talking and walking with me. The reason you have a moniker, a Christian, is because it means little Christ. And so when you're talking to people about Jesus, you're actually a little mini version of who he is. Amen? So you're sharing with them these things. You're saying, come and see who he is. Come and drink from his well. Come and dine with him. I want you to have his power and his purpose, and I want you to know his person. Peter's taking this test and so you can kind of see how Jesus says to him, do you love me? Peter, do you really love me? You see, Peter, from his perspective, is answering this question much like many in this room would answer this question. Lord, you know I love you. I've been to church twice this year already. You know what I'm saying? I got a one-year Bible. And Jesus is saying to you, no, Jeff, do you really love me? Am I the number one thing in your life? Or if you found out tomorrow, if there was such a way to do it that I don't exist, would that so destroy your life as to take your life from you? Or would you just move on? Jeff, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? 
And it's not so much the difference between agape and phileo, because real love has both of those things, as it is, am I the prime focus of your love? Or do you love maybe someone else on this earth more than you love me? Or in our culture, do you love your stuff more than you love me? Do you love your bank account? Some people might actually have a tough time answering that question because really we love our stuff or maybe our finances more than we love Jesus. And I can tell you how you can know. Because wherever you invest your time, your talent, and your treasure, that's where your love is also. Not that I said so, Jesus said so. Where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. Your heart is given over to the one that you worship and serve is that Jesus is the graduation question. You see, he's in the fishing academy. He's been catching fish. But Jesus wants to take him from catching fish to growing so much in Christ that he becomes a shepherd. He gets to do some land duty. And so Jesus kind of continues the qu- this, this quiz. And Peter affirms that he agape owes the Lord. Like, Lord, yes, I do. But he's still kind of falling behind the curve a little bit. You see, because what Jesus was getting at is, look, I, I want to drive this point home. Because the best way that you can be used for my kingdom's purposes in your life, Peter, is that you don't have any other love. I'm it. I want to make you an evangelist. I want to make you a pastor. I want to make you a leader. I want to make you an apostle. But you can't have another love. And we start thinking about these things from our human standpoint. It's like, wait a second. I'm not sure I can make that kind of commitment. And that's the question for each of us. Are you committed to what the Lord wants to do in your life? Are you willing to go from the condemnation that you used to have in the devil to the full commendation of the Lord's complete use of you in in your life? Because he has plans for you that you do not know. But you got to be all in. You've got to say yes. He's not going to force you. He's asking you, do you love me more than you love the things of this world? And if you do, then this admonition applies to you. It applies to me. It applies to us. Because there is exactly one thing that the Lord ultimately is concerned about on this planet. And that's sheep. People. Jesus came to die for people. He didn't come to die for buildings, denominations. He didn't even come to die for the Bible in that sense. He came to seek and save that which is lost and to draw men into himself Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we all need to be brought into the sheepfold. And so in that sense, Jesus is concerned about how good of a mini shepherd are you? Because each one of us is truly engaged in exactly the same process. Once you give your life to the Lord, you begin to mature in the Lord then you have a witness that you can share with other people to call people to come and see. And once you've done that, you also have the ability to say, look, this is what the Bible says on these things. I want you to drink of living water. Don't drink of the things of the world. Drink of the Lord Jesus. And here's how that works in your life. And then ultimately, it's like, now let's get down to the intimate walk that every one of us should have Let's commune with the Lord. That's what he wants for all of us. Yes, it happens to be my calling as a pastor. And as Peter would remind us there in 1 Peter 5, I am to shepherd the flock of God which is among us, serving as an overseer. 
Not by compulsion, willingly. Peter wasn't being cajoled into ministry. He was being offered an opportunity to feed lambs, tend sheep, and feed sheep. See people come to faith, grow in that faith, and then tend their life, tend their wounds. You know, too often, and, and I don't, I, I'm not trying to insult or hurt anyone or any ministry, but we live in a world that is so radically disconnected from all the various parts that we sometimes forget that Jesus said tend. In order to tend, you've got to get in with the sheep. You've got to be where sheep are. And you know what? Sometimes sheep are stinky. Sometimes sheep bite. Sometimes sheep are not exactly the most friendly animals. They look nice. Don't kid yourself. Sheep will bite you. They go places they're not supposed to go. Look, sheep are walking Velcro. So wherever they've been, they pick up every last thing that they've been near. So they've been walking through a field with cocklebirds, they're covered in cocklebirds. They walk through one with sticks and thorns, they're covered with sticks and thorns. They walk through dirty mud, their whole underside is nothing but dirt and mud. Sound like any people you know? Because we all be walking around everywhere and you know what happens. Get a little of this and a little of that and some of this and some of that. Be stuck on all y'all. You know what I'm saying, right? Then all of a sudden you go, man, what is that smell? Well, that's some of the world. So what does the shepherd do? The shepherd comes along and says, you need a bath, man. You get out the brush and you get out the ho- You got the fire hose to shum sheep. You get out some Mr. Clean pads. Because you got to tend. You can draw people to the, to the Savior. You can tell them the truth of the gospel. But at the end, you got to get in there with them and say, let me help you with that. I know you've been someplace you shouldn't, but I want to help you. So he says, look, Peter, I I want you to take lambs and make sure they start to grow. I I want you to mend and tend and nurture and instruct and bandage and heal and protect. I want you to do all that stuff with the sheep. And then once you get that process down, you just keep feeding them. Because if you feed sheep, they'll grow. And sheep will then multiply. And then there'll be more sheep. And then there'll be more under shepherds. And then ultimately, somebody like me, all I get to do is kind of be a little bit of a sheepdog. I get to run around and kind of make sure that all the sheep get back in the sheepfold with the shepherd. Baby lambs need milk. Mature sheep need a nice green pasture. But most sheep occasionally get wounded and they need a little bit of help. He's saying to Peter, Peter, if you love me, I love sheep. If you love me, then you love sheep. And if you love sheep, then you're going to take those babies and you're going to help them grow. You're going to clean up those mature sheep and you're going to help the mature sheep get even fatter for Jesus. Metaphorically speaking, of course. But he's saying, look, they need to get fattened up with the things of God. They need to be ready for what's going to be ahead in their lives. And Peter, I want to use you to do that. Right now, you're walking in the enemy's condemnation but what is true in Peter's life is true in your life because the apostle Paul actually said it there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus that's not God condemning you that's the enemy causing you to look back on your on your failures in life and say well I guess I'm a failure that's why one of our goals for this year is to let that stuff go amen you let it be part of the past 
You just get the loving and tending and feeding sheep, feeding lambs, drawing men, drawing women to the Lord. And then ultimately what happens is you leave the old fishing thing behind. Peter's not going to have to be a fisherman anymore. He's going to be fishing for men and be a shepherd. He's going to shepherd the flock of God. He's going to equip believers, just as Ephesians 4 says, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. No pastor is called to do all the ministry. The pastor is called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Then we do it together. Jesus simply loves sheep. And if we're really serving him, then we will simply love sheep and tend them and feed them and watch over them. And when we see them go in the wrong direction, we go after them because some sheep are lost, amen? Jesus went after the lost sheep. He didn't let them stay gone forever. If we'll do that, then we'll look a whole lot like Jesus. And so Peter now graciously is restored. He's ready for ministry. And he's going to move from here to the day of Pentecost in the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts. And he's going to take this message and he's going to set the world on fire for the cause of Jesus. And we can do the same. Amen? Would you stand and we'll close in prayer. I want to encourage you, if you're here today and maybe you've not ever given your life to Jesus, we have a whole team over in our prayer room that would be delighted to share the good news of the gospel with you, to offer you as a, as a new lamb an opportunity to come to faith. It's very simple. It's inviting Christ into your life to be the Lord of your life and forgive your sin. Replacing you as the final authority and making him the final authority in all things leading to life and godliness. We have a team in there that would love to share that with you and pray with you. Very simple. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. It's that simple. For the rest of us, it's time to get busy. There's a world out there that needs to know Jesus. Jesus. We could make it impossible for us to meet in this place in 2019. We could. We could see our friends and family and neighbors, all of them saved and come to faith and then begin to grow so that we need to do something else. I don't know if that's build the balcony or buy the forum or something. I don't know. Who knows what Jesus wants to do? But I know we need to be busy about our Father's business. Amen? So let's not limit him by what you think you can do or we can do. Let's just ask him what he wants to do and then do it. And as a little head start, we can love them, tend them, and feed them. Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you for the simplicity of the task that lies ahead for each of us. And Lord, we do love you. And we pray that you would help that love to grow. And that, Lord, as you do that, that we'd be more valuable to your kingdom purposes. We'd walk in your purpose and your power. Lord, that your plans would ever be on our lips. And God, that you would use us to grow your kingdom. Lord, we, we want to go home. But we know that your desire is to see all men saved, all women saved. And so, Father, help us to be busy about that, your business. Lord, preaching the gospel until you come. We bless you. Thanks for loving us sheep. Help us to make more sheep and then take care of those sheep. In Jesus' name, amen.